and welcome back once again welcome back to my channel my name is Rusty if you've never been here before and this is my channel where I talk about me favorite horror movies and me favorite music mostly metal and yeah tonight we are going to talk about one of those we are going to talk about 2017's A24 movie. I love A24. The Killing of a Sacred Deer. I love this movie. Especially when you want to be very, very, very... It reminds me of Agnes of God, if you've ever seen that. It's one of those movies where at the end you are left to determine for yourself. You have the information and you are left to de determine for yourself which theory you want to believe. You know, because there really is only a couple. Usually in movies like that, such as Agnes of God, which is my favorite one of those kinds of movies. This is pretty much the closest thing to it as far as that kind of uh, shocking ending theory-wise. Because Agnes of God, which I should do a video on that sometime is uh, Meg Tilly, Jane Fonda, and Bancroft, where at the end, you don't really know there is a supernatural explanation, and there is a non-supernatural explanation, and you really are left to determine, based on your own beliefs, which one it could be. And this is sort of the same way. Now, a kill, the, the Killing of a Sacred Deer was released in 2017, written by Yorgos Lathamos, and it stars Barry Keenan or Conan. I don't know how he pronounces it, because he's K-E-O, so that throws me. But it also stars Colin Farrell and... Uh, Nicole Kidman, Barry Benson, Herb Calais, Bill Camp. Yeah, so. Now, this movie opens in a hospital where we see um, Dr. Stephen Murphy. He has uh, his wife is Nicole K Kidman, Anna Murphy, and he's got two kids. But when the movie opens, we see him uh, having a weird conversation, which is about all that takes place in this movie. Um, a weird conversation about a watch. Um, him and his doctor friend, you are sort of introduced to the fact that he is a heart surgeon. And they have this perplexing conversation about watches and watch bands, which sort of sets the mood because you flow right into it very quickly after that I will give the director and the writer uh, who is the same person but I will give them kudos they they pretty much told you within the first five minutes this is what you're going to get and they do not let up <laughs> um, so we see him and uh, we, we next see him at a diner like you know like a little local diner where he is um, buying food for a 16 year old boy named Martin who continues the weird monologue talk the having a hard time figuring out how to say it, the verbiage in this movie, the tone. Um, they all talk, and I think that's what's so interesting about this movie, 
is that they all talk like automatons. They all talk like robots. It's very, very flat, very monotone. And I'll tell you what it reminds me of in a second. But we sit there and listen to them have a conversation about him loving french fries and you know they've obviously been meeting up and you really don't know what's going on you're like who who is this you know and they end up going to the next scene in which you get introduced to his family so the boy's not part of his family um, he has an older daughter who's like 13 14 and he has a son who's like 10 or 11 and they continue around the table you know talking and the way they are talking is so unique that I personally I personally can only think of one movie in which this kind of this kind of audio vocabulary was done in consistently but we get introduced to, you know, Kim and Bob, which is his kids, and his wife, Anna. And um, listening to them talk, I am immediately reminded of the original, not the silly comedic remake, um, the original Stepford Wives, which I think is one of the most fantastic movies of that era you know it's one of my seven seventies glory movies is the Stepford Wives and that's what they talk like they talk like the Stepford Wives very very monotone no divergence no emotion in their words just in their words just very very monotone it's it's the strangest thing and I probably would have been thrown had not I been a fan of Stepford Wives and had something to relate it to but we get to see that and then we get to see um, Stephen and Anna go upstairs and you don't know what's going on there either because she's like they're having these normal monotone conversation and then she stands at the edge end of the bed and she is like um, general anesthesia and he's like yeah sure and you're like the fuck is what what now <laughs> where she then gets undressed and lays on the bed as though she is under general anesthesia where he then like takes her which is not a good sign for a doctor that's not the kind of it's not the kind of erotic games I would want my doctor to be playing in private but that was that was weird <laughs> which is which is a reaction you're going to hear a lot so we get to see them do that then we see Martin actually come to the hospital and um, the next day Martin is at the hospital wanting to see him and once again you know they are it's kind of very awkward you don't really understand what's going on he tells him he shouldn't come to the hospital without calling him now at this point of the movie I'm going are they having an affair? Is that what this is? I mean, how old is this boy? <laughs> you know, because he looks like he's 16, 17. Well, it turns out he's 16. So I guess, you know, maybe not in every state in this country, but um, I guess, whatever. But I was like, is, is, he having, is he having an affair on his wife with this? What? So, we see them, you know, once again having these weird, awkward uh, dialogue between them that you don't really understand what's going on. 
and then it's, it's just all fascinating but um, they end up going to a party him and his wife not Martin but now we have this big party scene where we learn a little bit more about the doctor we learned that he used to be an alcoholic obviously and um, so we have that scene that he was a former drinker and the next day Martin and the doctor are meeting again uh, further fueling my suspicions that you know what the fuck and he ends up giving him a wristwatch the same wristwatch him and his friend had been talking about at the beginning of the movie so that was weird um, and once again fuels your imagination or wonderment as to what the fuck's going on and he invites him to come and meet the family come have dinner and meet my family and I'm like well if I factor that into are these have are they having an affair I, I guess I have to put a strike against that now but the boy acts like he's you see <laughs> so um, so Martin ends up coming to the house he brings flowers for the mom and he brings a couple of little key ring gifts for the kids and advises them that the reason he is bringing them the gifts is because you know he knows that she is into music so he brings her a, a, a keychain with a musical note on it and he had one that he knew the, the boy would like as well letting them all know that he has at least been around their dad and husband enough to know things about them right a little bit about them uh, like when he brought the flowers to the mom he's like yeah, I mean, I know you love uh, your favorite flower is fresh cut orchids, but I couldn't find any, so I bought you roses. So he sort of has let all three of them know that they have definitely been talked about, which would have gotten my attention real quick. But they're also robotic and Stepford wife looking. It, it doesn't really seem to make a, any difference. Uh, so these discussions are between him and the other members of the family. He goes up to the bedroom with the kids. These, th the discussions, I have to say, in this movie are so WTF. I mean, it's fascinating to listen at the dialogue between these characters. You know, I mean, this girl is just sitting there. I mean, they've only just met right and yet she's sitting on the edge of the bed and the, her brother is right there <laughs> and Martin is right there and you know they're talking about all this stuff you know and she's just like you know yeah um, I just got my first period last month I mean last week and I'm like TMI what you know and then the the little boy he's like do you have arm, you know, hair under your armpits, you know? And I'm like going, what? This is not casual conversation. <laughs> and, you know, and the guy's like, yeah. And, you know, Martin's like, yeah. And he's like, can I see it? And I'm, I'm like I said, the discussion is just, you know, so he, he like, sure. Here, you know. And the boy's like, oh, my dad's got, you know, are hairier than you, like three times hairier than you. And you are just, or at least I was. And I know a lot of people love this movie. And I think you're just mesmerized by the dialogue in this movie is just out there. So he gets, you know done with his conversations and he leaves that night him and the girl go on a walk blah 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 and um, that night you know the mom does ask you know how long have you been seeing him and he tells him that you know for a while he used to be his father's doctor 
dad, his dad had died in a car crash, and he can't, he felt sorry for him, and you're like, okay, all right. So, you know, you sort of like take it as that. And then Martin shows up at the hospital again and says that his heart's hurting and stuff like that. And right before, and this was the like the day after he had invited the doctor as a return favor to come to his house. So the doctor had went to him and his mom's house where they ate and then watched a movie. Martin insisted that they watched a movie. Then he got up and went upstairs and left the mom where she came on to the doctor and he got the hell out of there. And then the next day, you know, Martin shows back up at the hospital wanting to talk to the doctor about him having chest pains and stuff. And the doctor is like, has this really weird exam. And, um, very creepy and weird exam wherein the doctor ends up saying, you know, there's nothing wrong with you. You know, you're fine. And then Martin is like, uh, yeah, Bob told me that you have like more hair under your armpits than I do and have a hairy belly. Can I see? And I'm like going, this just gets weirder. And is this going, what the fuck? And, you know, and Colin, Farrell, you know, I mean, the doctor, he's, he's just like, okay, and like, unbuttons his shirt and shows him his arm, and I'm like, man, I'd like to talk to this writer, you know, just, just to, just to, just to see what he talks about in real life, <laughs> so, um, after he gets through with all of that, the boy is like, you know, I, I need to see you. Because, see, Martin had been avoiding him since the mother incident. So he's like, I really do need to talk to you upstairs. You need to meet me up in the cafeteria and not stand me up this time because they've been calling him and stuff. So um, the dad... The doctor goes up there and meets him, at which point, uh, where we then learn that uh, he doesn't want to, you know, the doctor doesn't want to hang with him, and he's like pushing him away and avoiding him. This movie is so hard to talk about. <laughs> Um, so he doesn't want to hang around and he keeps avoiding him and he's like okay all right all right now when he goes back home he finds out that his his daughter had went on a ride with Martin on a bike ride riding his motorcycle his motorbike and all of this kind of stuff and he's just like I need y'all to stop hanging around Martin, okay? Something's, y'all just need to stop hanging around Martin. And the next day when they get up, Bob can't get out of bed. His legs won't move. That's when this movie really starts going downhill. Not downhill in a bad way. I'm talking like their situation starts going downhill because you know, Bob, he can't move his legs. He's paralyzed. Um, they get him to the hospital. They do all of these tests on him. And um, they say that there's nothing wrong and he seems to be better. So they're going to take him home. So the mom, Anna, starts, you know, taking him home. And they try to leave, at which point... Um, they don't make it out the front door as they go down because he's walking now but by the time he gets down to the front door he collapses on the floor again and he never gets up after that for the rest of the movie so all of the tests um, there's lots of dialogue and with you know 
the doctor, Stephen and Anna trying to figure out. They do all of these tests. They can find nothing wrong with him. So uh, the, they walk in and they find Martin in the bedroom or uh, in the hospital room with Bob. And um, that's a weird scene like every other scene in this movie. And we really don't know what to think about that. And that's when Martin asked the doctor again to meet him up in the cafeteria because he's been avoiding him even more now. And you can see that Martin has started really getting upset about it. And he tells him, you're, you know, you're not going to, you don't stand me up this time. You really need to come talk to me just for 10 minutes. So the doctor goes back up there and meets him again. Only this time Martin doesn't seem to be as enamored as he had been all of this time. Instead, just like out of the blue, he just tells him, I'm going to just tell you this in as quick a way possible so you don't have to spend any more time with me. And that's when he tells him that you killed a member of my family and now you have to kill a member of your own if you don't kill a member of your family they will all get sick and die your wife your daughter your son they will and then and he tells them the stages first they will get paralysis then they will refuse to eat then their eyes will bleed and then they will die that is, and the way I've told you about the dialogue in this movie and the way that he told him and the, the look on the doctor's face was so flatlined um, it's just fascinating um, but he tells him this is what's going to happen and we learn the truth and that is that his dad didn't die in a car wreck his dad would died during surgery and the doctor Stephen Stephen was his doctor and he killed him on the operating table or at least that's what the boy is suggesting that he was drinking so it all fits back with what we had learned so far about him being an alcoholic and uh, not being drinking anymore and this kid's dad had died so it kind of ties in to why he's befriended him what their relationship is so you have to do that so of course the doctor is very disturbed and the next scene you see is two security guards escorting martin out the door <laughs> so the next, uh, I, I guess, yeah, the next we see the doctor, I mean, you know, he's really upset. The doctor's really upset. And he's gotten this news, and he goes down and notices that Bob, his son, has not eaten in a day and is refusing to eat, can't eat. That was stage two. So he, like, tries to force donuts down his throat, you know, down his throat, which his wife don't understand, you know, why he's being so freaky about it. Because he hasn't told her yet. So, um, and we see that Kim and Martin are hanging out at their house while the parents are at work. Where she tries to engage Martin in sexual activity, which he has no interest in. And refuses and leaves. And... Um, that's when we get to I think it's not like this movie hasn't been trippy enough but we get to the scene where Doctor is trying to get Bob to walk and they're like way off at a, in the corner of the hospital and he's trying to get Bob to walk and he ends up basically just 
picking him up and making him try to walk and then just dropping him on the floor. And he's so panicked, which is one of the few times you see any emotion out of any of these people, is he starts saying, you know, because they all believe it's psychosomatic. You know, it has to be because there is absolutely no medical evidence to explain any of this. So he starts asking Bob, you know, if this is real to stop faking. And Bob says it's real. And then he, he, he decides to tell Bob a secret. You know, if, if I tell you the biggest secret in my life, then you can tell me yours, which he's hoping is this has all been fake, that I'm just been faking. So he tells Bob one of the most, and I, I'm not even going to, I can't do it. He tells him a very, very disturbing story about when he was 12 years old and S-E-X assaulted his drunk and passed out father. And you're like, what did he just say? <laughs> and you like rewind it and you're like, did I, did he say what I think he just said? You know, and then you listen to his story again and you're like, ye gads. <laughs> You know, and he's like, I've never told that. And no, you shouldn't have now either. <laughs> you know, and you're kind of like, I hope his dad didn't ever find out, you know, what he had done to him while he was passed out drunk. Oh, my God. But. Um, so, yeah, he. Swears, though, that he is not faking that this isn't a lie. So, you know, that was about it. Kim then loses the ability to walk during choir practice. She suddenly falls and can't walk. And that ends up making both of his kids be in this situation. Both of them are now refusing to eat as well. They got side-by-side -side beds in the hospital room, you know, at, at hospital. So... He can't take really any more of that. The doctor ends up going to the house where he says something that I actually agree with. When he goes and it's like banging on Martin's door and he's like, I know you're in there and nobody refuses, you know, they refuse to come to the door. But he starts screaming, you know, if anything happens to my kids, you have no idea how hard I will fuck you and your mother just like you both want and I thought that's the truth right there because that boy from the first of the movie you could tell it wasn't just I mean that boy was obsessed with him just just like the mother was obsessed with him and you start like I said this was like the second emotional outburst so the reason these emotional outbursts are so interesting is because of what I've been telling you about the flatlined, emotionless, automaton, robotic monologue, you know, just everything is so toneless and emotionless that when these little explosions do happen, you're like, they're, they're like really powerful because you have been trained by this movie to expect only flatlined Stepford wife monologue speaking so you're actually kind of stunned when these emotional freakouts happen so he leaves and ends up going back and telling Anna the truth about who Martin is that 
his dad was a patient that had died on the table and that he obviously blames him and that that's what's going on. So, you know, she ends up um, kind of questioning it. And yet she really doesn't have any kind of emotional reaction either. So even hearing all of this, she speaks in this monotone. Really, did you? Yeah, I mean, it's very strange. So, yeah, tells Anna about it. And Kim walks one more time in the in the hospital room, in hospital. Uh, and the mother catches her walking. She managed to walk to the bed to the window because Martin was on the phone down there. So that's a little piece of information because as soon as Martin was not on the phone anymore, she collapsed again. You know, and the mom is like, you're not allowed to speak to him anymore. And, uh, So Kim it gets mad at her and tells her that she'll understand what it's like soon because if it happened to both of them that she was next. Now how she knew that, I don't know. But she told her mother that it would be happening to her soon enough and she would know what situation that they were in. So Anna ends up finding out all of this information and going and confronting Martin and that was a very interesting scene as well because he lets her in and he's just in his boxers and eating spaghetti and it's just also matter of fact to him and after he says the weird stuff that he says such as I guess trying to upset her that my mom likes her likes him and wants him and he likes her which isn't true but um, he gets no rise out of her who can <laughs> it seems um, and instead she looks at him and asks him if this is true you know what my husband has told me this thing going on why would me and my kids have to suffer for something my husband did? If my husband was drinking and killed your father, why, why are you hurting us or why are we being harmed? And he ends it all by just saying that he didn't know whether this was right or wrong. And that he didn't know that if this was fair. He couldn't speak on the fairness of it. But that it was the closest thing to justice for him taking his dad. So Anna ends up going to his best friend, the one that we saw at the beginning of the movie, who's his anesthesiologist. And trades a sex act to get him to tell her about the incident with Martin's dad where he does admit that um, the doctor, her husband was drinking and that during the surgery and that's the, probably what caused him to lose that patient during the surgery. It's about after this. Her behavior even during the sex act was Stepford Wives. It was, it was just weird. But this is about the first time that we see an emotional reaction from her. Because... 
you know, when she gets home, she finally does have, I guess, what two automatons, two Stepford people, could consider an emotional blowout when they do have this confrontation where she asks him, you know, to shut the F up and to go do something about this that why can't he do something about this so we see the biggest emotional blowout in the entire movie when he just starts smashing up all the dishes and stuff out of the cabinets um, on this monologue about well we need you know virgin pubic hairs and and snake oil and and bat's teeth and stuff like that which i think what he's doing is he's going we've basically been told we're under some kind of voodoo type curse so how do i break a voodoo curse <laughs> you know uh, so I, I got his point and the i i could understand his point because you know him and his monotone monologues um, and she's screaming at him having a, you know how dare you talk to me that way is what he said you know because she's like why don't you just shut the fuck up with your talking and do something about this and so he flips out and I can I can really understand what he means because he's like it's voodoo it's witchcraft that's I mean that's what we're being told it's voodoo and witchcraft what do you want me not a shaman not a witch what do you want me to do about witchcraft <laughs> and that's why and that's why he was like breaking dishes and stuff you know around the kitchen uh supposedly looking for some kind of secret brew ingredients to fight this voodoo curse and you're like that's good that's a good scene because how would you react to that <laughs> You're being told to do something about a voodoo curse because that's what it seems to be. Um, this, it seems like this kid has cursed you in some voodoo way, you know, sangria or something. And uh, what are you supposed to do about it if you're not also a shaman? Okay, <laughs> it's like a. So, I liked that scene and that his emotional temper tantrum was both interesting to see, but. I understood the point of it so in an effort I guess to fulfill her wish he does go and do something about it he wakes her up later on that night and tells her to come with him that he needs to show her something and what he has done is he has went and kidnapped Martin and he has Martin tied up very well in a chair, in the game room, in the basement, where he has already beat the ever-loving hell out of him. And he's got a rifle laying across the pool table. And he has obviously been torturing Martin. And her reaction to standing in the doorway and seeing it is Stepford wife perfection you know she just stares and he tells her to go get them something to drink or something and she's just like okay and turns around with I mean it's like robots from hell it's so cool I mean it's like really coolly I mean you know unique and I really liked it but so he continues to slap him, beat him, stuff like that. He gets too close, though, and Martin, like, really bites the hell out of his arm. And when he gets loose, you know, Martin starts, like, screaming at him, like, so what is payback? What is vengeance? What is eye for an eye? What is it? And then he says, I'll show you. And then he, like, literally bites a big chunk of flesh out of his own arm and spits it across on the floor 
you know, and he's like, there, what, what, what does that do for you? So, okay, Martin ends up getting the rifle and shooting him in the leg. And I think he's, he's just about to kill him when Anna comes back in and, and convinces him not to do that. So, you have this scene where the kids, the two kids, and this is so sad, you know, the, the two kids are like discussing with each other who's more valuable and who they think their dad's going to choose. Because see, all four of them know about all this now. So, the son really, that almost made me cry. Because he goes, you know, his daddy had been bitching about his hairstyle at the beginning of the movie. So he goes and like cuts his hair and goes and shows his dad crawling across the floor. Uh, shows his dad that he had cut his hair. Um, because you have these two kids trying to um, make themselves the one he chooses. Now, that starts my problem that we'll get to at the end of this movie. Because we seem to be missing the obvious choice. And I think you, I think you know. Um, it's the one problem I had with this movie. But, so that's a really interesting scene. And you see Anna go down there and beg on her hands and knees, kissing his feet to Martin to, you know, try to get him to stop and not do this. And then the daughter, she crawls down there and tells Martin that she'll run away with him, but he has to make her well first and that she will run away with him. Um, and he doesn't. And she's like throwing stuff at him, you know, because he's just looking at her like, and that's, we're going to discuss the theories, but he's looking at her like he can't do anything about it. And that everything that they're doing is pointless because he can't do anything about it. So when the dad you know, when the doctor and Anna wake up, Stephen and Anna, when they wake up and find her gone, and then they go down into the basement, you know, he's like, she's already, she's not here, she left. And he hauls off and punches him again, and then they go looking for Kim where they find her. And uh, she has literally crawled, pulling herself with her upper body. She's like crawled and scraped the skin off her knees. They take her back home where she then gives up and she's just begging her dad to kill her that she will be the willing sacrifice once again in my opinion overlooking the obvious but um, that hurts him really bad. And the next morning, Bob's eyes start to bleed. And that's the final stage. And the doctor's going to go down there to Martin, but Anna ends up telling him that she had let Martin go, who was beat half to death with a big bullet hole through his leg and a giant flesh out of his arm and beaten to a pulp. But she had let him go. The daughter's like, why the hell did you do that? And Anna was just like, because, you know, there's no point. So they all kind of like give up and the doctor ends up going, okay, well, okay, so the 
ending scene or the ending of the plot. He takes them down there. They all get dressed. He takes them down there. And he puts them in three different spots. And ties them up. And puts uh, pillowcases over their heads. Where he then stands in the middle. With a ski mask. Over his face. Not the kind with holes in it. Not a balaclava. But a solid one. And then he just spins around. In a circle. And fires. And he has to do this. Three or four times. Which is like nerve wracking okay to watch and on like the third or fourth shot if it wasn't the fourth it was the third but I don't think there was more than four but he shoots it hits Bob in the chest the little boy which is very sad and then the next day or not, well, maybe not the next day, but later, him and the daughter and Anna, the mom, are sitting in that same diner, and Martin walks in, doesn't say a word. They don't say nothing to him. He walks by them. He is still, like, black and blue. Dude looks like he's been in a gang fight. Um... He goes over there, gets him a drink, and sits there and kind of just like stares at them every once in a while. And she stares, the daughter stares at him every once in a while. And then she's got this big giant hamburger and french fries and, you know, chips and burgers. And so she's eating it. And then they all get up and leave and walk out. And he just kind of stares at them drinking his drink. And the door closes, and the movie is over. So, that was all fucked up. <laughs> now, here's where the fun of this movie comes. Like I had mentioned earlier with Agnes of God, um, what happened? What was this? Okay, here's the theories that I've, I've heard. There's only a couple. If he did do something physically to them, he did have the opportunity to poison them somehow. Then why didn't the poison continue and why wasn't it discovered with routine tests? Maybe it's some kind of voodoo powder? You know, but if he did physically do something, how did him killing the son stop it? If it was poison or something like that, how would him killing the son stop it? Okay. So the only other thing is supernatural. Was he the angel of vengeance? No, that's not likely because there is a discussion between them two in which Martin tells him that he knows about this because it happened to him. So Martin alludes to the fact that he knows what's going on because it had happened to him. Almost as though he was in the position that the doctor is in now because that is what he said. He said that he knew what was going on because it had happened to him. He had experienced it. So, because he knew that the doctor had killed his father by drinking on the job with surgery, 
he knew that this curse would fall on him because it had fallen on him for some similar reason. And he recognized and he sat around and watched and when it did, he knew what was happening and that's how why he told him. Okay. Second supernatural theory. He, through emotion, which he definitely showed, he, like Buffy the Vampire Slayer, when you call Anya, the vengeance demon, he, through the power of his rage and loss, he called this curse. He called the angel of vengeance. He called this curse down on the doctor. That's the other theory. So, you're left to wonder which one of the, you know, there's, there's four. You have the, somehow or another he was poisoning them. Which, I don't know, there's just not a lot of evidence for that. Are the three supernatural ones. He himself was the angel of vengeance. Which I don't believe because, you know, of his own weirdnesses, his own obsessions, his own... I mean, I don't really think you're going to beat the hell out of the you know, angel. And he could have shot him if he wanted to. So I don't know. That one doesn't make sense. And then you have the other two. Either he, like he said, he had been on the receiving end of this curse and recognized that it was going to happen because he knew what happened or, and saw when it began to happen and was able to tell Dr. Stephen Murphy that this is what is happening because I went through it. That is what he says. So it's either that one or through the power of his own rage he called it down. Now the most likely one is the one that he alluded to. He didn't say when, where, how. Okay. But he said in the movie that he knew this curse because he had experienced it. So, you have to choose one. That's the one that I choose. Is that, I don't know what he did. Is he the reason that his father was in the hospital having surgery to begin with? Did he? But then that would negate the curse, right? Because if the doctor didn't kill him, if he had killed him like with poison or something, and he was cursed because of it, you know, because of the curse, you see where this all goes? <laughs> you don't know. It's just like with Agnes of God, you know. Did this virgin nun get, have SEX and have that baby? Or was it a mental virgin birth like stigmata? You don't know. You have to, like, make up your own mind. Now let's come to the, I, I told you there was a problem. Okay, this movie is like an 8 out of 10 to me. When it should be like an 8.9 out of 10 to me. And that's because I have a serious issue with the ending. Now, Martin. Martin. When he explained the curse to the doctor. He told the doctor, you have to kill a member of your family because your actions took a member of, you know, took a member of mine or anyone's. But because you took a member of my family, you have to take a member of yours and or they will all die from this curse. But he said, I cannot tell you who. You, 
you have to choose your wife or one of your kids it's one of your family members your wife your son or your daughter has to be killed by you like you killed mine or they all die let that sink in okay what kind of mother now the doctor's not going to die to break the curse he has to kill one of them or they all die now the mother knew it the kids knew it what kind of mother is going to allow one of her children to be killed there's not there that's the one flaw in this movie is that there is no mother that would sit around and go oh you know one of the three of us well I guess we'll just have to take our chances and draw straws no mother is going to do that no father is going to do that a real one a decent one no decent moral ethical parent is going to not sacrifice themselves um, Anna Nicole Anna Nicole Anna Nicole Smith is not in this movie <laughs> Nicole Kidman's character Anna that's where it came from <laughs> Nicole Kidman's Nicole Kidman's character Anna that was cute the way that happened wasn't it um, sh there's no way that a decent mother would not have gone look there is no question okay we've come to the conclusion we accept what's happened we are cursed and one of us is going to die here's what we're going to do I'm going to go upstairs and I'm going to get into a nice warm tub after we have a good dinner and make love one final time I'm going to go upstairs and I'm going to get into the warm bath and you are going to come in and you are going to stab me in the arm and rip my arm open and I am going to calmly and quietly bleed to death murdered at your hand as the curse requires because how is that any different than you blowing somebody's head off with a fucking rifle okay so that's the problem with this movie mr writer is that that ending doesn't make sense for any kind of decent parent and you had nothing in this movie but absolute love and joy for their kids so how could anna since you made so clear that these two parents were great parents loving parents head over heels for their children how would she not how would she allow that you know spin the rifle to take place no decent mother would have done that the answer is right there in front of you all Martin said was you have to kill one of your didn't say how didn't say who you just have to do it for the end you know you took a loved one from me you now have to take one of your loved ones there was your answer right there was still been sad and it would have made a lot more sense if the mother went upstairs and now granted she couldn't kill herself because that would not fulfill the curse but I had the best idea okay he goes up there grabs her arm splits it open with his own hand and she bleeds to death um, as the sacrifice that's not against the rules he told us the rules that's not against the rules so that was my only problem with this movie is that the ending seemed out of place 
Yes, it was very stressful. Yes, it was very anxiety inducing. Yes, it was very sad. Yes, it was very dramatic. But then again, so would that seem. I mean, just picture it. You know, a nice dinner. The kids are crippled in the bed. And they're, you know, they can... They could hear the parents make love one last time, knowing what was coming, hear the doors closing, that scene where he would go in there and cut her wrist and, you know, but why did it have to be so disgusting? You blow your kids, you play spin the rifle and blow your kid's chest open? It's not, it just doesn't make any sense. Now, a lot of people did ask, well, how come nobody's in jail? Well, first of all, Martin didn't going to go to jail. What's he going to say? He's going to bring up this curse? And, um, well, the doctor killed his son, though. How come his son didn't, you know, how come he's not in jail? How did they get away with that? Because they're both doctors, remember? The kids were in the hospital. The kids were dying. The kids were starving to death. They were having feeding tubes down their throat. They were allowed to go home to die. Okay? So, yeah, for a split second you can go, how come they didn't get caught for killing the kid? Because, as far as the hospital knew, as far as hospital knew, as far as all the, those specialists that they called in, those kids were dying. They both only had days to live, according to the specialist, because they couldn't eat, they couldn't walk, something was wrong, they were dying. So I'm sure that because this information, you know, an autopsy isn't 100% guaranteed. There has to be a reason for an autopsy most of the times. So if you have a cancer patient at home, and it doesn't die under suspicious circumstances and the death is expected you can get a you know they're not going to do an autopsy so I imagine that um, they just had to put clothes on him and call it in that you know they are doctors so they could probably call it in take him to the hospital our son died and there's not going to be any question about it because everybody was expecting that. That's what they were waiting on. The whole hospital staff was just, they would be amazed that the girl was still alive. You see what I mean? So, no, there's really no question as to how they got away with that. Um, but like I said, the Nicole Kidman's character, Anna, allowing the spin the rifle thing was unbelievable because there wasn't a mother wouldn't do that even though they were all acting they all acted like nuts from the beginning of the movie um i don't think that they would have allowed that i think that he would have you know she would have sacrificed herself he couldn't but she would she as a mother would have sacrificed for her children so that's my only problem with this movie yes 2017's the Killing of a Sacred Deer, Colin Farrell, Nicole Kidman, and Anna Nicole Smith is not in it. <laughs> so yeah, Barry Koenig, I mean, Koenig. I really loved him in this movie, so I'm going to be like nice and... K-E-O-G-H-A-N. Kogan or Keegan? Keegan or Kogan? Barry Kogan? Barry Keegan? I've never heard him say his name, so I don't know it. But, yes. The Killing of a Sacred Deer. 2017. Him. And Anna Nicole Smith. <laughs> Nicole Kidman. And Colin Farrell. And I will see you in, in the next one where hopefully I can continue to make really, really nice bloopers for you to, like, cut out and arrange. Can somebody do that for me? Make a blooper reel? I was watching Pirates of the Caribbean blooper reels last night. They were kind of funny.
Someone cut mine all up for me and put all of my bloopers together. I'll put it on my channel for everybody to see. But I will see you in the next video. Thank you very much for your time. It was another long one, I know. Um, but that was a very interesting movie, and I had a lot of theories and discussion about it. But I will see you in the next video. Keep rocking very, very hard. Keep screaming, but only when appropriate. Remember, you are a very special and unique person, no matter how many bloopers you make. And uh, love you. Miss you. Bye-bye.